Hello, I'm David Tudor again, and this is the 12th in a series of short videos on conflict security, stability and development. This time, in what is, uh, for the moment at least, the last in the series, I'm going to look at the question of what are the major security problems of today and those that are upcoming. Now, this is such a potentially vast field that I could easily spend 20 minutes doing nothing much more than listing various possibilities, um, trying to describe them briefly. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you a very personal view. Uh, and I'm going to begin by uh, suggesting at least a couple of things that we can do to make sense of the, the rash of security problems and potential problems, both primary and secondary that the world seems to suffer from today. Um, I think the first thing that we need to do uh, is to understand where security problems are fundamentally new and therefore have to be looked at in uh, a completely new and unprecedented way. Where security problems are perhaps old problems but in a new form and therefore we have to look to see what's been done in the past uh, and maybe modify that. And thirdly, of course, where security problems are old and well known. I'm not going to uh, mention very much about the third category, because I think that's probably done to death, if you'll, uh, if you'll forgive the, uh, the term, uh, in, in many standard treatments of this issue. I want to focus on the first two categories. I want to start by talking about problems which are not really new, but which perhaps uh, appear in a new guise. Now, the first type of problem is one where the, the category it already exists, uh, where to some extent the, uh, the moral dimension exists already, the, the normative framework around the problem exists already, and where there is a history of uh, dealing with the problem in an earlier uh, in an earlier incarnation. Uh, a good example of this is that there's nothing much in the world today that could be considered to be slavery or human trafficking by the sort of definitions that were common 100 or 200 years ago. So what we see is an attempt to take current phenomena, many of them, it has to be said, unpleasant, uh, and relabel them in terms of the past. Uh, thus suggesting that these are problems we know about, these are problems that already have a built-in moral dynamic to them that tells us what we ought to do. So quite a lot of today's problems um, are given names from the past in order to provide a, a practical and ethical shortcut which tells us what we should be doing and, and why should we should be doing it. Another type of problem is really... Uh, an old problem disguised as a new problem, or several of them. Uh, let me take um, cyber warfare, uh, a term I should say not, um, not very much in favour uh, with those who actually understand the technologies involved, but it's a term we're probably stuck with. What's striking about cyber warfare, if, if we must call it that, is that there's very little that is actually new. It's very largely a um, a rehash, a, a modernized version of things that have been done for a hundred years, in some cases before, interception of communications, for example, uh, but also theft of secrets in, in different ways, um, and a whole series of other sabotage and damage-related activities. Uh, quite what is different, I think we will have to wait and see if anything is really different. In the meantime, it's probably fair to say that, that uh, if you have another means of attacking somebody, cyber warfare is not very uh, effective. As someone who uh, was involved with the area said to me uh, some years ago, I'd rather have a bloody great hammer. Uh, nonetheless, it may turn out that in the future there are new security problems, genuinely new security problems. The difficulty with something like cyber warfare, much more than, say, slavery or human trafficking, is that very few people really understand it. And to the extent that people do think they understand it, uh, 
they've picked up ideas about it from television and the media, which in turn pick up ideas from each other, uh, and the whole thing becomes uh, a complete shambles. Um, people are afraid of uh, cyber warfare because it's something they don't understand. In a very real sense, and I haven't got time to do more than uh, nod in the direction of this issue, but in a very real sense, the internet uh, of today is yesterday's spirit world. Uh, and many of our reactions to the internet are the same as the reactions to the spirit world and to magicians and sorcerers and uh, witches and so forth uh, in, the, in days gone past. Um, Programs, loosely uh, loosely understood, are spells, uh, usernames are the uh, anonymous names by which magicians protected their souls and all that kind of thing. Uh, having your credit card details stolen is the modern equivalent of having your soul abstracted. Um, it is for this reason, this re mixture of ignorance and fear, that uh, problems like cyber warfare get a huge amount of publicity. Nobody really understands them, but everybody's frightened of them. They have something in common with uh, chemical, biological, and radiological technologies, uh, again, which have much the same mixture of fear and ignorance. Nobody really knows how they work, but everyone's frightened of them. The fact that you can't see them uh, or, or touch them uh, adds to that aura of, of magic. In fact, as I know from having dealt with those technologies uh, for a number of years, they're mostly pretty inefficient at actually destroying things and killing people. But that doesn't mean that people aren't frightened of them. So there's a whole series of technologies out there um, where a combination of ignorance and fear paradoxically does supply us with a, at least a potential security problem. Uh, it's easy to see, for example, that uh, if there were a rumour of chemical weapons being found in the middle of a city, uh, you would immediately panic people into uh, a kind of mass flight which would probably actually cause deaths and injuries. Um, so sheer panic, um, based on fear and amplified by an irresponsible media, is actually a security problem in itself uh, with respect to all these technologies. Okay, I, I'm going to leave uh, that category of problem, um, which is essentially uh, old problems, uh, but repurposed and refashioned for the modern world. I'm going to leave that kind of problem aside because I want to talk about what I think is an underappreciated but very important security problem. And like a lot of these problems, it begins as a secondary problem in this case, is the failure of a political system. Uh, and it could have all sorts of unpleasant uh, primary security effects. Indeed, it is arguably already starting to have them. Uh, what I would say simply is that we're dealing, uh, and this is really by far the most important political problem that the world itself as a whole faces, we're dealing with the, the final breakdown of liberal democracy. Now, it has been the case for a long time now that people have argued that liberalism uh, and democracy are compatible with each other. Liberalism, both in its economic sense, these days often described as neoliberalism, uh, to differentiate it from social liberalism, uh, which is a different creature. Um, not simply are these two uh, phenomena supposed to be compatible, they're actually supposed to be mutually reinforcing uh, and even uh, necessary. If, if, you're, if you're to have one, you have to have the other. And it's that which we have seen uh, as a triumphal ideology over the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War. What we're seeing uh, effectively is that uh, as controls on economic liberalism in particular uh, have become less and less effective and weaker and weaker, uh, the consequences for democracy have become graver and graver. And we can see that the political system in a number of Western countries has more or less broken down. Now, 
I don't want to enter into um, uh, attempts here to, to foresee the future. I don't know how in Britain or France or the United States or Germany or Italy things are going to play out. It's simply enough to say that political systems breaking down are never a good idea. Uh, maybe uh, at some point governments will once again get a grip as they used to have on liberal economics. Uh, maybe they won't. And, in, and maybe uh, liberal economics will shake political systems to pieces. We'll have to wait and see. But it's tempting, uh, and I think it's unfortunate that this happens, but it is tempting. It's tempting to then invoke the ghosts of the 1930s and say, well, we know what happens uh, fascism is back and so on. This isn't necessarily true, and I think it's also uh, unhelpful. History never repeats itself in that neat uh, form formulaic fashion. What we can do is we can say that in the case of uh, the Western world, for example, the longer-term consequences <coughs> excuse me, um, of attempting to impose liberal democracy are uh, still to be seen, and they, they may be uh, extremely grim, they may be a bit less so, we'll have to wait and see. But outside the West, it's fairly clear that um, uh, attempts to construct liberal democratic states, uh, particularly on the territories of former colonies, have effectively failed, and failed in a, a fairly important and, and catastrophic way. Um, one of the reasons for this is that liberal democratic states that is to say, states which are democratic but have liberal uh, economic and social systems. Uh, liberal democratic states have, uh, in order for them to be successful, to meet a number of quite demanding criteria, which we don't often think about. We just assume that these things are natural. Uh, let me just mention three, and if, while I go through them, you keep in the back of your mind the situation in many uh, former colonies, many countries today in Africa or the Middle East. Uh, I think you'll see where I'm, where I'm going. Uh, the first of them is to do with, with frontiers. Uh, the idea is that in a given state, a state is effectively just an administrative structure, everybody wants to live in that state. Nobody would prefer to live in another state Nobody would prefer that part of that state was part of another state, and nobody uh, would uh, prefer either that some part uh, of a neighbour was annexed to them. Uh, this is a very ambitious uh, kind of uh, target to aim for, and on the whole, even uh, advanced Western European democracies can't actually claim that degree of 100% correspondence between territory and population. Uh, the, the second, as a, uh, as a requirement of the first, really, uh, is that such issues as ethnicity, religion, culture, history, and tradition are not, in the end, important. People are undifferentiated consumers seeking to maximize their individual liberty uh, and their financial prosperity and they don't really have any other concerns in life. It doesn't occur to them that they might be members of this group or members of that group, uh, or that they were members of the same group across the frontier in another country. We're all effectively maximizing machines. Um, and the third, which is a consequence of the first two, is that the political system in a liberal democracy is a pure political system which is to say it's the contest of professional political parties for power. Uh, politics is a bit like football. Uh, you win some, you lose some. Uh, politics is essentially an issue of class and uh, the maximising, uh, the financial and freedom maximising machines that we are, select from the prospectuses of various political parties those we feel will advance our interests and we vote for them. Now, obviously, even in the West, this is a, um, a vision of life and a vision of politics which is pretty far removed from reality, and that really is the source of many of the problems that 
Western uh, political systems face today. But it's, it's also obvious, I think, that it is fantastically removed from the way in which most people throughout the world uh, conceive of their society, their place in that society, uh, of politics, uh, and of the whole relationship of the individual to the community and the country. Um, it is an attempt to, or it is the attempt, I should say, uh, to push this model uh, of society onto um, uh, on, on, on post-colonial uh, societies around the world, which has caused such a problem. And there are one or two other elements which are not explicitly stated in the liberal democratic model, but which are essential if, if it is to function. Uh, for example, one of them uh, is that uh, what is described by Max Weber as the emancipated state exists. What he was getting at was that uh, up until a certain point in European history anyway, the state was simply the servant of the ruler, uh, often a hereditary ruler. At a certain point, uh, the state became uh, a neutral, objective entity which served the national interest, uh, served the, uh, the, the, the collective interest rather than the interest uh, of the ruler uh, and was a permanent structure to serve whichever political party was capable of taking power. Again, I think if you look at uh, many areas of the world today, uh, such a characterization of the state is, is laughable. Uh, it, it, it simply bears no relationship at all to what happens on the ground. And that isn't because of moral frailty or corruption or anything else. It is simply because that is the nature of the society uh, that these states have to operate in, and indeed the, the political leadership has to operate in. The big assumption which lies behind uh, these problems, it's the ultimate source of them. The big assumption is that you could take an area of territory uh, and you could give it to a political movement and say, here you are, here is a country. And it was assumed that questions of ethnicity, uh, religion, culture, history, etc., either didn't exist or could be somehow magicked away. Um, and certainly back in the 1960s, the assumption was that uh, states in Africa and the Middle East would modernize very quickly. States in Africa in particular would uh, produce, um, uh, I'm sorry, would, would, uh, would prefer uh, the cultivation of cash crops for export, which would generate funds which would industrialize the country. And that by now, uh, independent states in Africa, for example, would be much like states in Western Europe. This is what people thought at the time. Well, we, we can't all be right all the time. But the consequences of this are that uh, political groupings were given often very large territories uh, without the, the state uh, capacity to manage them and without uh, the resolution of tensions between ethnic, religious and other groups which took hundreds of years in Europe to finally, uh, to finally be resolved at the cost of a great deal of bloodshed and suffering. Now, national leaders in many cases did try to, conscientiously enough, build uh, Western star nation states. These uh, efforts did not last very long. Many opted for one-party states on the basis that this was probably the only way uh, in which the, uh, the centrifugal tensions in many of these new countries should be coped with. Uh, and that was, that was not a stupid thing to do, actually. Uh, it worked quite well in a number of cases. Uh, in a number of cases, however, it led to one party rule, to dictatorship, uh, to authoritarian states, in some cases to models imported from the Soviet bloc, uh, and in other cases to, out of despair really, attempts to cultivate pan-Arab or pan-African identities and state systems to replace the ones that obviously weren't working. Unfortunately, pretty much all of these things failed, not because the people involved were incapable, but because the problem had no solution. You simply couldn't go from uh, territories which had been part of empires for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, through various hands, 
and simply say, congratulations, you are a state, uh, get on with it. It was simply not possible. So the result of that was that in many ways we have a system which doesn't work, uh, but which we are constrained to somehow uh, try and make work. And in the past, I remember many discussions along these lines with friends in Africa, where we'd, we'd all agree that there was a total uh, was a whole situation was a total shambles. And then somebody would say, yes, but what's the alternative? Uh, we can't simply unmake the state system. Well, I think the point to end on, and this is where I think the security problems of the world uh, are likely to come from in the near future, is that there are actually people out there who are trying to unmake the state system and start again. This, of course, is where the Islamic State comes in, because just about the only way of constructing a state uh, on any kind of rational principles that hasn't been tried is on the basis of religion, uh, of excluding those who are not part of your religion and enforcing discipline on those uh, who are. This gets around all the territorial problems. It gets around all the problems of the liberal state, because there isn't one. Now, what we may be seeing, not only with the Islamic State, but with Boko Haram in uh, Nigeria and the Sahel, and various other movements which are inspired uh, in the same way, as well as um, organized crime, as well as militia groups which proliferate in many of these areas, is in effect history beginning again, history climbing out of bed uh, after a rest of hundreds of years and beginning the state-making process. You can argue that there were parts of Africa and the Middle East which are now in the situation that Europe was in uh, around the turn of the previous millennium. Um, if that's true, it does mean that, in a sense, history is on the march again, that the nation-states which the West attempted to create in and after the 1960s uh, have now comprehensively failed. But instead of collapsing, as uh, a lot of international uh, theorists had supposed might be the case, they're actually being eaten away from within. They're being reconfigured from within as groups which characterize themselves by some kind of mutual loyalty of ethnicity or religion or whatever, uh, get together and exert control over a small area and try to expand outwards. This is absolutely classic state formation. And it's something that didn't happen, for example, in Africa, uh, where the attempt was to go to the last stage rather than go to the first stage. Jeffrey Herbst has written uh, very well about this. So what we might be seeing at the moment is uh, a reconfiguration from the ground up of territorial space uh, into the control of different groups who will not be liberal democratic and are not interested in either liberalism or democracy in the sense in which we understand it. But they will resemble much more the warring states of, uh, of Europe in the early Middle Ages a combination of financial and political and military power. And you only have to think of the sad history of Europe uh, to have, uh, I think, some qualms about how all this might work in other countries. Unfortunately, I think it is a process which has now begun and cannot easily be stopped. In the short term, it will mean uh, organised crime because, uh, as has famously been said, the state is effectively a type of organised crime. So aspirant states will be built on the basis of organized crime, at least as, as perceived by the state itself, uh, uh, together with ethnic cleansing, together with conflict and war, together with migration from areas of conflict elsewhere. Now, this isn't a very appetizing uh, future, uh, and it's not perhaps a very high note on which to end this series of lectures. All I would say is I think that after uh, a very long parenthesis uh, where colonies were the major, uh, the major political system throughout the world, we've had a very short period of time when we have attempted to construct nation states quickly uh, and from the top down. It hasn't worked and I think what we're going to see 
from now on is the creation of nation states from the ground up with all the attendant uh, suffering uh, and blood and that is perhaps a suitably apocalyptic note on which to end these lectures. Thank you.